Good morning, LRNR community. This is your uh, instructor, Carrie. So I'm getting straight at it this morning because I have um, a little lecture presentation that is going to last about 10 minutes. I've been practicing. I've gotten it down from 20 minutes to 15, and I'm going to do 10 this morning. Um, it's a really excellent little slideshow that recaps uh, end caps are week one. So you guys have done a phenomenal job. Uh, already we've moved through uh, three chapters of our text together. We've, um, many of you have reached out to me about uh, getting your uh, free copy of the SUNY text, the information literacy guide, which is supplemental to what we are doing, but most of our exercises come from that. So if you haven't picked yours up, uh, do go pick, up, pick it up from the Merced College Library for those of you that have gotten a hold of me. And um, for those of you that want one, you send me an inbox, a Canvas inbox. Uh, really the best way to, um, to talk to me, if not stopping in for office hours, which are Wednesdays, uh, 10 a.m. to 11, so I'll be in office hours directly after this lecture, is to send Canvas inboxes. Um, pronto is a great way too. Uh, I don't think that that's really caught on for our class yet, but we'll see because um, uh, as we start moving into our more uh, project-based um, assignments, you're going to want to collaborate with your peers. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, if you are joining uh, mid-lecture, um, I've dropped the Google Doc link into our, um, into our chat box. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate to the slides. And please go ahead and, and click on that Google link. And that's where all of our notes today. So um, just a re, oh, actually real quick, just a quick, uh, overview of what this lecture is going to cover today. So we're going to do this quick scholarship is a quest uh, slideshow lecture. And then we're going to do, um, we're going to do an overview of the part three video testimonial um, that's up and live and ready to go uh, on, um, on Canvas. So uh, do get over there and start looking at the rubric and um, start looking at the script. So there's some parts that I am asking that you do, but they're very, very simple. You have a lot of room to infuse the video with your own personality. And then we're also going to do a quick overview of the Explore topic assignment because that one, um, if you've done it already, it's pretty simple. It's really very easy. It's very reflective. It's mostly getting uh, using your cognitive, using your metacognitive skills by acknowledging what you don't know. And those information gaps are crucial to our process of learning, a process of research. So um, you'll hear me say it, but research is never a straight line. So this is really building that foundation for acknowledging when we don't know something. And then we will actually circle back to this, uh, to the no want learn chart um, as we move forward. All right, so let's get started on this mini lecture. And again, this is all being recorded. So uh, that's how you're probably watching it right now because I don't think I see anybody coming in. So let's go. Okay, so this excellent slideshow is from our author uh, for our main text for the course, William Badke. Um, so Badke uh, has this wonderful analogy that scholarship is a quest um, and that it stems from its profound discovery, a burning desire to solve um, problems. And we do that by uh, acknowledging threshold concepts and building on those as a framework, as our foundation. So we've gone over, um, we spent, you know, most of our last three weeks talking about our foundations of, of this class and the theories that undergird 
information literacy and librarianship and information science and research in general. So um, I, we will go into each of those ACRL frameworks in a little greater depth. But that this um, that scholarship is a um, it's a quest. Okay, so it's a conversation. So let's begin with framework one and this authority is constructed and contextual. So what does that mean? First, acknowledge your own voice in the process. So everything that you choose, you give it a little bit of authority. So um, you're using your agency and your power of choice to to acknowledge that work. So it's um, uh, the authority is uh, meets requirements of your information search. So that's you. And then authority is constructual and it comes out of a particular community. And we'll see this again and again. So when authority speaks out of its um, or a person uses their authority. So this would be, say, an official speaking out of the authority given by his her position. So if our mayor speaks out, if our president speaks out, they that's their authority because that's their job title. Um, if an observer speaks out of an experience, so say um, you know you interview somebody from that terrible explosion in Lebanon, they experience something, and so uh, maybe a, a newspaper or a blog, they or even Twitter, if they tweet about it, they are tweeting about their own personal experience, and that has authority. So um, you have to be skeptical and evaluate that um, level of authority. Um, and there is an ecosystem. So if we're talking about that context, uh, there are um, uh, there are communities that build on each other and we're going to look at that a little bit later in some of these other frameworks. So information creation as a process and these different methods and purposes uh, and content all represent deliberate acts of creation and that um, information's value, we must evaluate both its purpose and content. So um, uh, the purpose of, of something being formed is it there to persuade? Is it there to, uh, to educate? Is it there to um, uh, sell? So know that format affects our perception of a piece of information. So Google is an excellent example. So Google does indeed determine the type and quality of information found. So as you know, um, and if you don't, uh, Google is um, supported by advertising. And the way that the algorithms in Google search is that they give priority to those that have uh, paid into their advertising coffers. So when your uh, initial search uh, is is produced or is, is run, your top um, your top results are usually paid ads, um, or they are organizations or institutions that have um, paid into Google so that they can be placed there. Uh, so that sort of um, um, acknowledgement of purpose of information is very important to understanding our, our information need. So information has value. This is, a, this is a very interesting one because I think a lot of people feel like information is unseen. Perhaps in our newer day and age of internet and uh, uh, advertising and the way that we understand that messages are um, constantly coming at us, that there is a true value ascribed to those. So it can be as a commodity to buy and sell. It can be as a means of education and as a means of influence. Um, these are all truly important ideas. So let's take a look at this uh, UCs, so University of California. Uh, this example is um, that Elsevier. Elsevier is one of the largest um, databases. So um, the UC systems, this is their library database, Elsevier. And they were charging millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they were way above because they, they sort of had a monopoly. And um, eventually it, it got to the point where no, it couldn't be sustained and the UCs eventually left. But this true commodity is what also drives your tuitions. 
So um, these publications, um, as you can see over in the right hand side, here's the United States. We are uh, number one in total papers published. And that means that our, our, it raises our, uh, our standing in the, in the world. So if we're producing this awesome amount of, of information, of educational um, wealth, uh, uh, this can be uh, reports or um, uh, research on medicine, it can be on astronomy, it can be on um, uh, sociolo sociology, uh, societal issues, psychology, you name it. This is, this is where the United States is pushing and that's why many students come from abroad to study here. So uh, society, the, the value of society, in, information contributes to our ability to also um, spread the idea of democracy throughout the world. Um, we wouldn't be able to do that if we didn't have something to back it up. And that is information. So research as inquiry. And uh, this is the process. So this is that behavioral process that we have been looking at for the last three weeks. We've been acknowledging our own voices. We've been acknowledging uh, that language, the language of academia is different. Um, I'll go into an example in a little bit. But so research is inquiry. The two, the true, is a true research is a quest to resolve an issue or problem and there can and it can be framed many different ways so uh, they use a methodology um, uh, let's uh, determine research methods um, create questions to address gaps in knowledge and that's what we'll be doing uh, here in module two um, interact with multiple viewpoints this is vital acknowledging multiple viewpoints is how we push the conversation forward. Right, we'll, that'll be a little bit more in the next module, or excuse me, next slide. But here we have an example of a research problem statement. So even just locating what the research question is, what the real problem is, is a feat into itself. That usually takes uh, looking, doing a literature review, um, uh, reviewing background information, doing an annotated bibliography, uh, this is how we recognize, oh, hey, I see a pattern here. Um, I think this is a issue that I would like to maybe do um, a survey on. Um, a psychology paper with a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a, it's a proposed solution. It's not something, so, you know, as you may remember from biology class, but a theory would be something that is a working solution. Whereas a hypothesis is a, mm -hmm. From our data, we gathered that this could probably work. Uh, and this, it's really, really important that those methods are questioned. So scholarship as conversation. So um, uh, true scholarship knows that in most research problems, there lies a history of conversations. So um, we understand that when an issue is bound up with ongoing conversation, um, we can identify the conversation, its main points of view and its main players. So we are looking to see who are the experts in the field and we'll use research to make a contribution to the conversation. So even your personal learning histories are indeed a contribution to the, to the conversation. You're involving yourself in the scholarly conversation of um, uh, examining uh, behavioral learning, right? So here we have uh, an example. Uh, I like this one. So Smith says that blah, 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 but James found out that blah, blah, blah. Dickinson agrees with Jones, but Black, Blackstone thinks that Smith is out to lunch and Corbin thinks they're all stupid. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to use that word. But all of this may seem very confusing to an outsider, all right? And frankly, uh, because every academia, every, every academic discipline uses a different language. Um, but an example of how this conversation, so those experts, Blackstone, Smith, Jones, they each have within their larger discipline, they each have little niche. They have different 
um, hypotheses that they've developed to solve a problem, um, maybe the similar problem, but not the same. And so they're providing uh, their, their critique. And here, um, this example provides, is a really good sample of how this author has acknowledged some of those expert voices um, despite their conflict and has shown that this is a previous and ongoing conversation. Um, there and here we have some criticism of one or the other's work and um, this is how we show those variety of perspectives and uh, acknowledge that the uh, that there's there's different ways to view one topic there's no uh, you know I hate to disappoint you guys but there will never be a clear clear answer um, and, but that's not your job to figure out what the clear clear answer is it's your job to either hypothesize maybe um, offer this is my findings and I think that this could work um, or it can also be um, forming that question asking that question and pushing the field forward all right so searching a strategic exploration and this is one of my favorites and I think that um, I actually have it listed in the syllabus but searching for information is not a straight line sometimes you have to go back to something you worked on earlier or you may have to drop it you may say no more this is if I invest any more time in this it's just going to be a waste but this involves planning and strategy at every stage. And so having a good understanding of the tools available. So we've already started exploring our tools from our Boolean operators, search limiters, um, using um, OneSearch, uh, using the library databases. Um, so we already are starting to explore our tools, um, knowing when a research path is blocked and can find another path with giving up, without giving up entirely and are not afraid to retrace their steps and try something again. So you will confront those no results. And what usually is <laughs> um, an issue is spelling. I've noticed this again and again, and it just makes you feel a little crazy when you are, you know, you're trying things out, you're feeling tired, you're like, these are this, academic language is just so absurd stick it in google and grab and copy and paste that into your search box spelling can be overcome but try again keep trying so in summary what is scholarship it's a quest an adventure into a problem or issue uh, i encourage you to use your curiosity so scholarship is not it's not a uh, asking you to give up your personality. It's not, ask, it's not saying that you need to think like everybody else. All scholarship is, is it's a standardization of the way that we talk. And when you, when you have all these different voices, it's really important that you have a way to standardize it. So you'll see that um, uh, it's simply a, um, it's a method in and of itself um, that then makes it searchable. Because if we didn't have that standardization, a librarian like myself couldn't identify certain hallmarks like the author, title, the um, ISBN, the date, what the introduction is, what the methodology is used, where's the conclusion, where's the review of results, and really importantly, what sources did they cite as well? Um, so that methodology, or excuse me, that standardization of scholarship is very important. But it's, but it's an expedition that demands good methods, critical thinking, and retracing of paths, and a path to discovery and advancement. So when we are engaging in that process, just like we're doing with our personal learning history, we are pushing forward. So for example, next semester, uh, I will probably ask, uh, before, I, before I push on to next semester, I will probably ask a few of you if I can use your personal learning history as an example for other um, sections of this class. I, I 
I like to ask that because your work is so wonderful and vital and, and other students want to see what other students are doing. So you are contributing to the discipline information literacy uh, and by contributing your voice, you're doing much more than you than you think you are. So, okay, so that was our little spiel. I didn't really keep it down that long. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into um, our overview of the personal learning history part three video testimonial. So I wanted to go over Let's go ahead and look at our canvas shell here. And, oops, that's not it. Um, okay, so this week's canvas shell, I have a little word art here. And it's just, uh, all I did was, um, I used this really cool app and I, I put it right in here too. Um, it's free and you go and insert whatever words you, you want. So, um, what I did was I took your personal learning histories and I identified some, some common themes and some vocabulary that I saw again and again. And then the, the word art mixes them all up and um, puts them into uh, whatever like shape you want. I could have done a heart or a sun, but I think, you know, word cloud. Um, since we're, since we live in the cloud these days. Um, so I thought that I would share this with you guys. And also this would be something that you want to include in your e-portfolio. Um, I wanted to go over, oh, and this is where our lecture is going to live today. So when I'm all done recording this, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, save it to what is lecture. Okay, so uh, let's, let's skip, skip, skip. Okay. Also, there's been some really wonderful content created that starts to talk about exploring a topic. Um, and for your exploring a topic um, assignment, uh, you are welcome to use some websites or databases or none at all. I think if, if I'm being honest, I would like you to use none at all. But if you really feel like doing a quick uh, familiarization with artificial intelligence or Facebook, um, it's within the scope of technology. So keep that in mind when, you, um, when you're filling out the form. Um, and please use a Word document and actually fill out the little boxes. Uh, it should be editable. Um, if for some reason it's not editable, then you can go create a separate document and put in the no want learn box and copy it and send it to me that way, but the document should be editable. Um, so when we're talking about exploratory sources, so oftentimes students are worried about it being scholarly. Um, we are not ready to talk about scholarly peer reviewed journals yet, um, but academic information uh, can look like anything that has analysis, it more or less depends on how you are giving it agency and authority. So for instance, the Pew Research Center is an excellent uh, exploratory website. They will, um, they, they survey a vast uh, swaths of, of people. They're very credible and then they, um, uh, break down that data and provide um, reports. So for example, if we're interested in poverty or presidential approval, population trends, um, this would be a great place to go. Um, I'm looking, uh, here's migration, um, elections, uh, technology, 
teens and technology. So let's just take a quick look at this teens and technology. And they provide these topical, okay? So when we think of research, um, when you're beginning at the very, you know, just getting to know you phase, topical research is the, is the umbrella. So it's the umbrella of information. And it may include um, a few issues that shape the color of the umbrella, but we're not into issues yet. Um, here we have uh, US schools closed due to coronavirus face a digital homework gap. Um, so this, these are ways that we can look at what's get a current snapshot of what's happening, um, a temperature gauge, if you will, and what's happening with um, teens and technology. And this can help us uh, shape what direction we want to take a research question. So exploratory research is really where you can let your um, curiosity lead you. And you can make connections too. Um, so perhaps in that teenage uh, technology, I'm looking at science and innovation. Um, I could say I'm interested in um, teens and technology and, uh, and limiting the spread of COVID-19. Okay, I don't know if that would work, but I can start making just these sort of see if things interlock. We'll be doing a concept map next week. And uh, well, with your assignment, I guess I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. Um, the assignment, we are also having you choose a topic. So I gave four, I gave four that you could choose from. And I would ask that, when you're doing your know, want, learn, that this, think of the, think of the issues that you would like to connect with your, with the topic that you've chosen. Now you're not, you're not married to that topic, but it, they do each have a sort of separate bead. And where we can go from here is using that exploratory topic that no want learn and start to identify um, and concept map some of the deeper issues and start building our research, our research strategies. Um, and this is all leading up to our midterm, which will be a database evaluation. So uh, we use, well, I, I did, uh, I'll go back to these, these databases right here. So these are some of the library databases uh, that are um, up for grabs, if you will, for your um, database evaluation. But if you feel like working outside the box, you are welcome to use, say, Amazon or YouTube, um, Twitter, one of the um, social media giants, something like that. So uh, when we talk about the criteria for the midterm, um, you're gonna need to uh, identify advanced searching tools and demonstrate how to use those. So keep that in mind. But our um, exploring a topic um, will also be starting to recognize reference sources. Okay, so reference sources are dictionaries, encyclopedias, bibliographies, almanacs, et cetera. These are how you can really define specific topics or you can um, get background research. This is an excellent short video that illustrates reference sources to a T. And the library provides quite a few that are available on uh, digital platforms. Um, you know, due to COVID-19, we don't have access to all the print material, which is where we would go spend some time doing a lovely scavenger hunt looking for reference, um, reference articles. But in this case, 
there is nothing holding you back from going on um, and clicking on any of these. So for example, Gale Virtual Reference Library is one of my personal favorites. Um, so you'll encounter this, this screen. Here's my first name and last name with a period in the center. And then my username, I'm sorry, my password. And then this is called a firewall. So we're past the portal firewall. And now here we have our, um, this is what the Gale Virtual Reference Library looks like. So here are the reference books that are here. So um, if for instance, I, I wanna look at this book. So we talk about formats um, and we talk in identify depth of information. Uh, a, a book, even though it's scanned in as an electronic source, it still has the depth of a reference book. It doesn't change just because it, the, the, the nature is now digital. Uh, the depth of information is still, it's a reference item. It's a reference book. Um, you'll need to drop down and search by either the chapter or you could just come up here and uh, into search within publication and type your search right here. So I could say children and submit and it's gonna search only within this uh, book, okay? So the one nice thing about doing it this way is that I do know that I'm searching within the scope of criminal psychology. So here I have something on juvenile homicide, once I click on this title, that title right there, it took me to the article. And now I have something very, sh pretty short. You know, it's not that short. It's, it's a pretty in-depth article. All these wonderful works cited here too. So works cited, references, see also's. Um, these are all the scholarship that they surveyed to build this article, okay? And these are also ways that you can data mine as well. And we'll, talk, we'll be talking about that in greater depth. All right, these C also's, oh, sorry. So these are uh, just big uh, chunks, so you can jump around in the text. All right, so I didn't wanna to spend too much time going into those, because uh, we will be looking at those a lot. Um, but they're here for you. Okay, also acknowledging Wikipedia. So as you know, Wikipedia has been sort of, um, it's been gaining in credibility. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, but most of your instructors or most of your teachers have always said, uh, you cannot use a Wikipedia article. I don't know, maybe not, maybe times have changed. Um, a lot of you are, um, uh, newer to, to college, so you tell me. But anyway, the, um, the, the point of Wikipedia is it's this uh, sort of web 2.0. It's, it's a way to share, uh, especially fast moving information. Um, and the only, the, the biggest drawback, of course, is that there's no way that we can really prove who's authoring the information. So that's a problem. And uh, when we think about authority and we think about, you know, you're, you're choosing an item to use, you need to feel confident that that item has, um, that, it sh that it demonstrates exactly how they found what they found. But Wikipedia does have all their sources listed at the bottom. You can click on and go to and use those as part of your um, research. All right. So as the instructor, I'm going to move on past, but you do need to take this. Um, there's two points assigned to the four questions. So it's a total of eight points. Um, okay. So here's the no want learn. And um, you can come to this uh, download document into a Word doc. I've got it open. Got it open in the Word doc. Uh, 
here we go. Okay, so it's, it's up here. But here are our four choices, climate change, e-waste, artificial intelligence, and Facebook. Um, and those should generally um, be searchable out in the open internet, or if you feel like you have some knowledge about that. So for instance, I would come into this box right here. So what do I know about Facebook? All right, so Facebook um, uses advertising and um, their ads are sometimes political. Okay, uh, what else do I know? I know they collect our data. And I think I have to have, uh, what you know about the topic, two to three sentences. So I could, I could leave it right there, but that I feel like I'm kind of saying the same thing right here. So let's see, it's um, social media giant where people get into fights. Um, lots of anger. I, think, I feel like it's like a forum for people to just get on there and, and vent. Okay, and then, so how do I know this? Um, well, I know they, ad, they have advertisers because I see their ads and sometimes click on them. But I also sometimes see ads pop up from other sites that I didn't click on. So yeah, didn't think it's kind of weird, like you'll go onto another site and then without having even gone to Facebook and then suddenly there it is sitting in your, over on the right hand side in Facebook or you get a little, like it's in, within your screen. Um, I know they collect our data. How do I know it? Um, I don't really see it, but I, adjusted my privacy settings and um, and I also heard about it on the news. Okay. And how do I know that this people are getting into fights? I see my friends and family fighting with each other. like never before. All right, so how confident are you in this knowledge? So the advertising and the ads, I mean, I could use my own experience. I know my own experience, but how much do I know about their advertising? Probably a two, I guess. And then how about for the privacy settings and collecting our data. Gosh, I really got to say, I, I know like a one. And then um, I see my friends and family fighting with each other. So for me, people get to fight some lots of anger. I feel like a one. Um, I don't know, maybe I'd even give myself a three on the advertising, just because I've, I've read some articles and, and have done some other sort of, it, it kind of interests me, but I guess, you know, this is really, oops, um, this really acknowledges my, uh, my knowledge gaps. So I've got some work to do. Okay, so I might start with just looking at background information about Facebook advertising, um, how they collect our data, or um, why there's so much anger on, on Facebook. What's the behaviors that's happening, okay? 
All right. So that's that's it for this for this particular assignment. But we will be revisiting this chart as we move forward. So uh, keep this one in your back pocket. And also, this might be a nice assignment to upload to your ePortfolio and use it as a as a reflective piece later on. Um, okay. All right, so we already did this the explore topic assignment. Now let's go back to the part three video testimonial. So um, we are in our last leg of the personal learning history. And I gotta say, uh, y'all have done really great work. Uh, I've seen a lot of sharing and with your peers, I think, uh, that was sort of a high point of the whole experience was the peer sharing. Um, and, and I hope one thing that you understand is that your role in, in learning is reciprocal. Okay. So it is important for you to show up and to be there and to be present um, in order to learn. And what I mean by that is when you're with your peer and you're listening to their, you know, them really talk about some, some deep stuff, right? Like those moments when they, they learned or they excelled or struggled or, or encountered a barrier and maybe shared some wisdom. Um, you know, those are the moments when um, being present is, is so, it pushes that, it pushes that intellectual trust forward. Um, and it's not, it's not just with the other person, it's within ourselves. So you get to practice looking um, as, as outside of yourself. Uh, which is sometimes a really hard thing to do. Um, we do that when we write. We do that when we write. Uh, I know that I'm not as good about journaling as I should be, but I do try to practice it. And it's, it's an important um, uh, cognitive tool to, to use to take yourself out of your own, you know, your own monkey mind. Um, that monkey is driving the, driving the ship. Um, take a step back, do a little journaling. Uh, it, it will greatly serve you. Uh, so when we are doing that peer share, I, I really saw a lot of you um, make some excellent observations, um, some, some beautiful common threads, and I, I really am very proud of the work that you've done. So the next, so this final step is, is really simple because you guys have already done the work, okay? You've already done your personal learning history reflection, and you've already done your peer share. So when you go, oh, and, and let me say this as well. If you are feeling like you did not get enough time with your peer, maybe in the breakout session last week, hit them up. Just send them, a, send them an email, send them a Canvas inbox and say, hey, you know what, can we, can we maybe um, do a quick FaceTime where we hit on some of our points? Or, you know, I, really, I didn't really talk about an experience or an example. Let me let me talk about the time when I cooked something that was, that my grandma taught me to make or the time I learned how to play basketball um, or play a sport or play a uh, um, whatever, a video game, something where you made a, made a real uh, leap where it's something that you'd struggled with before and made a real leap. So that's really what we're kind of looking for for, well, not kind of, that's what we're looking for with the personal learning history narrative. And I, so the, the video needs to be three to five minutes long. So three to five minutes, that may seem like eternity, but I promise you, it's probably going to be more difficult to keep it under the five minutes. Um, I know for me that I've, my video that I've posted below is a take one. I think I'm going to try it again this afternoon and um, see if I didn't, don't get a little bit better, but I worked really hard to keep it under, uh, 
to keep it at three minutes, I, I timed myself. I set my, my timer for, for one minute to hit up each section and I still only got, I almost hit five minutes, okay? So there is a script and the script is there to help any of you that are not sure about what to say. This is also for those of us that really feel comfortable to just remind you about what to hit on. Okay, so right off the bat, I, I need you to identify yourself. So my name is Carrie, um, and this is my personal learning history during fall 2020 at Merced College. My personal learning history begins with, I think I went out, talked about high school. Okay, so, and then, so I, one minute right there. Then onto the peer share. So you can, um, I, I'd like you to start off with the golden line I have selected from my peer share is, and I think mine was about being a bad student, which is, uh, anyway, watch my video. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, I chose this golden line because it spoke to me. It sparked this curiosity about this new person that I just met. Um, it provided a valuable insight into my learning process, into, into his learning process. Okay, so these are, these are the ways that you can frame, frame talking about your peers' golden line. And then finally, the conclusion. Um, a common thread I discovered during this process is, um, during the personal learning history, I observed that learning happened when I was anxious and I didn't want to do something, but I forced myself to do it. And then after it was done, I felt great. I hated it the whole time, but man, the afterward, I really felt like I accomplished something. Okay, so that, that is kind of the narrative that we're looking for, right? And then finish it out with just a thank you for your time. Sign off. All right. So now let's talk a little bit more about the technical issues. So, okay, that just goes back into a little bit more about the testimonial. So the video content itself. Now, depending on how uh, comfortable you are, um, you may use Zoom. Uh, you can use Screencast-O-Matic, or you can use YouTube. You can, you can record it on your phone, but it does need to be downloaded at, or excuse me, uploaded to YouTube. And the reason that I'm asking for this uh, is that it's more compatible and it will also embed into your uh, e-portfolio, which um, they, they only accept certain formats. So uh, YouTube is, is a great way to go. If you have never created a YouTube account, um, go to this, follow this link right here and it will, it's a, it's a video that shows you the step-by-step -step guide for how to create a YouTube channel. Uh, from there, you can upload video. I don't know, I don't think you can record from there. I, um, I went ahead and opened up my channel here. Now there's a way to create a video or post. So here's my channel. So when I start out, um, here's just my YouTube channel. I just typed in youtube.com, right? And then over here in the upper right, here's create, YouTube apps, notifications, and then my account. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to create. Here's upload video or go live. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my channel uh, which I thought was over here. Um, let's go, I'm gonna go to the library real quick. No, um, how did I get to my channel? I'm gonna go ahead and do the create button right here. Well, you guys at home are so smart. Hi everyone, the purpose of this video is to show you. I'll let you, I'll let you find where your channel's at, but, when you're Hi everyone, in the purpose of this video is to show you great examples of e-portfolios. Oh, here's a video that you guys will be watching very soon. Is it here? Mm. 
Okay. Home, library, history, my videos. Okay. I'll go to my YouTube studio. It's probably over here on the left hand side that I just didn't see. Okay, here's kind of what I was looking for. So over here on the left hand side, here's my dashboard, here's my channel. So I'm actually view channel on YouTube. So I'm gonna click my, my little self icon there. All right, so here's my, here are my videos. Um, so I can go to videos, uh, I can go to my videos, which later, Here's um, things that I've saved. So when I'm ready to create, so if I go to upload video, this is where uh, it'll prompt me to drag and drop. Um, yeah, thank you. So as far as I can see, and you guys are expert um, use your, use your schema, use your experiences. If you know how to record on YouTube, I say go for it. If you need to go live to do it, I don't know if that's the way to do it because it broadcasts to your whole channel. I don't really think that that's, um, that's the way to go. But let me demonstrate Screencast-O-Matic, which is one of my favorites because it allows you to pause the video as you record. And this is a free service. And uh, you can come to start recording for free. It may ask you to sign up. And you can use your um, use your personal or your school email address to do that. And then you open up the screen recorder. And you'll get this little frame these little dot dot dots around the frame. So once the screen recorder's up, you can do the little record button. It's got a microphone, all that good stuff. Okay, so uh, once you're done, you can upload it to your YouTube account straight from, stream, from Screencast-O-Matic. Oh, there it is. So see the little dot, dot, dots? Here's the recording. And you can either choose just your screen or webcam, so just, just your face, or both, which is similar to what I'm doing right now. Okay, uh, so a note about submitting. This um, assignment needs to be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, I really recommend that you are able, that you apply closed captions. Closed captioning is an important tool that you'll need to use for all videos. And what it does is it gives accessibility. So um, the Americans with Disability Act, ADA, is a standard in our society these days. To include a video, um, especially for teaching purposes or whatnot, adding closed captioning is a very important um, step. So it's, it's, an, it's an extra step. I'll, I'll, our time is up. I'll find the uh, a YouTube video and post that to our shared Google Docs, along with our Screencast-O-Matic link. And so let's do Screencast-O-Matic, YouTube, adding closed captions. Okay, so I'll add those links here. And I also want to remind you that anywhere uh, that if you ever want to access that Google Doc and you're not sure where it's at, it's in our modules. It's in our class, class tools. All right under shared Google Docs. Lastly, I wanna mention real quick, this is also where I'm posting any texts that we share for the class. 
So here we have um, those bad key, chapter one, chapter two. So for any of you that are waiting, we are already on chapter three. Uh, if you haven't gotten your book, please get your book. Uh, we, we need that to um, help contextualize what we're working on. All right, guys, so that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I will have office hours from 10 to 11 um, today at Wednesday. Uh, but if you need to get a hold of me, please send me an email and let's chat. Thanks.